So even before we do good stuff, you know, we think about God as, as kind of the mean taskmaster with his whip, kind of the ringmaster of the cosmos, you know, and we jump through the hoops, and after we jump through the hoops, you know, he goes, ah, oh, good job, not bad. And maybe that's even a stretch for some of us. But did you know that God applauds us even before we do something good? And the evidence for that is when Jesus was baptized, before he did anything, all his miracles and teachings and things like that, right at the beginning of his ministry, before he did anything, he said those words, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Before Jesus did anything, he didn't do the great God stuff and all this. Before all of that, God was well pleased. And that's an example to us too, that he's pleased with us. Not always pleased with the stuff we do, right? Okay, but he's pleased with us. There's a love, an overflowing love that God has for us as his children. And to remember that, that nothing can remove us, the Bible says, out of his love. We can refuse it. We can turn away. We can do our thing. But God continues to shine, just like Jesus said. It's like rain falling on people or the sunlight falling on people. It's faithful. He is faithful to do that. And so we're continuing a series called Be Still, Learn to Be Still, and Know God. Learn to be still and know God. And for a lot of us, you know, come up on Drummond Island, and it's kind of like Fantasy Island, you know, and we, we enjoy ourselves and have a great time and the, hear the birds and the crickets and the waves lapping on the shore, and it's just a great time fishing and boating and swimming. A and then you go back to normal world, you know, and the busyness and anxiousness and the pressure and all of this stuff. And I thought we'd take a break and learn to take something very, very precious, and that is our ability to be still. And it's a, it's a learning process. But our ability to learn to be still in the presence of the storm and find that place of trust that will be like diamonds to us, that will be like a treasure to us in all that we do. And we started out, we're on, we're on the fourth part right now. We did breathe, learning to something as simple as breath, to remind us that the Holy Spirit, which is, it, it's interesting, spirit and breath are, are the same biblically, to learn to breathe in the Holy Spirit, something simple, different activities, learning to expand our vision, to see the bigger story of what God is doing. We get caught up on our own little stories and we think, oh, life has ended, <laughs> I'm done. And God says, no, there's, there's a bigger story there. We learned last week to surrender our expectations that God can take our dreams. He can take what we have out of Psalm 37. He can take our desires, our dreams, our hopes, everything. As we put them into Jesus' nail-scarred hands, He will take those dreams and hopes and He will make a bigger story with those also. If we surrender, if we are able to let go. And today, well, I'm thinking about a story. It's a story about David and Goliath. Remember big old Goliath? And, and it's told that the Israelites saw Goliath standing there on the hill, and they said, he's so big, we'll never kill this guy. And David said, he's so big, I can't miss. It's about attitude. A shoe company one time uh, was sent two salesmen to a very rural part of Africa to, uh, to kind of scope out the prospects. And one of the salesmen typed back or emailed back and said, uh, he said, nobody wears shoes. He says, prospect is nil, zero. The other salesman said, prospect is great. Everybody's barefoot. It's all about attitude. It's all about attitude. One time, uh, General Creighton Abrams, the Abrams tank, during World War II, General Abrams was leading a platoon of men and they were surrounded on all sides by the enemy. And he said, gentlemen, he said, for the first time in this campaign, we have the opportunity to attack the enemy from any direction. It's all about attitude. 
There is a story about the devil and one of his assistants. And the story goes something like this. There was a demon. He was walking along and the devil and the assistant were watching and he bends down and picks something up. And the assistant calls to the demon and said, what did you pick up? And the demon says, well, I just picked up a piece of the truth. And the assistant to the devil is shocked. And he says to the devil, he says, what are we going to do? I mean, this is not good, is it? He picked up a piece of the truth. And the devil said, no worries. He said, I'll make sure he makes a religion out of it. And it's all about attitude. And getting the whole truth. So today, we're about transforming our thinking. And if you've caught a theme in all of this, the whole key, you might say, in one sentence The key to being still and knowing God better is transforming our thinking. Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to this world. Don't be formed or conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. And if there's a constant in all of this, of what we've been saying, of how to get close to God, it's about dealing with the old tapes, the tapes that we play inside of our heads, and allowing the Holy Spirit, which Jesus called the Spirit of Truth, allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and give us a thorough scrubbing. Even our good ideas, ideas that worked for us at a time in our life, may not work for us right now. And that's why the whole renewal process, the renewal part of our thinking, the Bible calls it repentance, which literally means to change your mind about things. And you can change your mind about something, even though your feelings are kind of percolating and and messing all around and, and jumping like popcorn. Even though your feelings may not cooperate right away, you can change your thinking and make different choices. Even though you go, "Uh, this is really new stuff for me. This is untested ground. But I'm going to trust and I'm going to make a new direction for myself, at least in terms of my thinking, transforming my thinking. And so the idea is, is to get a hold of truth, to allow truth to work on us, marinate us, massage us, infiltrate us. And the only source for that truth, it's not about, it's not something you're going to read in a manual. The Bible is a good start, but the Bible points us to a truth that is living and breathing and alive, dynamic truth in the person of Jesus Christ. And you say, well, he died 2,000 years ago. You know, it's kind of tough to communicate in that way. I'm not used to doing that. But God can teach you through the Holy Spirit, which is our connector, our connecting person. The Holy Spirit can connect you with the life of Jesus and even the mind of Christ, as Paul writes about to the Corinthians, the mind of Christ, and you can learn to have that same mind. Now the trick is, though, that when you begin to allow truth to work on you, And this doesn't matter what your religious preferences are. I don't care where you think, well, I believe in these things and these are my doctrines and this is all this. Fine. But guess what? It's about a personal commitment to letting God change your mind about life. And once your mind is changed by the Spirit of God, you will never, ever see life the same again. And I'm not saying for some of us it happens like an aha experience and we go, (gasps) and all of a sudden life goes from black and white to color. That's for some of us. 
For some of us, it's a gradual thing. And you begin step by step, degree by degree. As you commit yourself and trust in God, He will begin to change the way that you see things. And as your attitude changes, so will your actions. As your attitude changes, so will your actions. And so as you transform or allow Jesus to transform your thinking, your feelings and your actions begin to change over the course of time. And there's a sense of joy, of confidence, a groundedness, like you're, I'm ready to go. And you're excited about life, even on Monday mornings. <laughs> excited about getting going because God's got an adventure for you every day. Because you're never, just like I said to the kids, you don't do life alone. If there's anything the Bible says, loud and clear, you don't do life alone. Not real life, not capital L life. So I've got a story for you that illustrates, I think, think this idea of transformed thinking. And it comes out of Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, you can follow along. Except I'm going to warn you that I'm going to read it out of a translation that may not sound like yours. It's called The Message. It's by Eugene Peterson. We're going to pick up Acts 16 at the 16th verse. So it's Acts 16, 16. And it's one of the most unusual stories maybe you'll ever hear or read about in the Bible. But it illustrates what we talk about approaching life from transformed thinking. Paul and Silas, his sidekick, the Apostle Paul, they've arrived in, in a city known as Philippi. It's, it's in the area of Greece, kind of just outside of Turkey. Paul has been proceeding along on his second missionary journey. He's got four in all. The fourth one leads him finally to Rome. But uh, Paul is a missionary. He's an apostle. He's establishing churches and spreading the good news of Jesus and, and talking to people about that and finding people who are listening. And so he's proceeding along in the western part of what we know as Turkey today. And God says he wants to go north and, and spread the good news. And God says, nope. Not happening. He goes, how about south? God says, nope, not happening. And in fact, then he has a, a dream, a vision, and somebody gets very specific. The guy in his vision says, you're going straight ahead into Macedonia. Okay. So Paul took his marching orders directly from God. He went straight ahead, works his way a little bit down the coast, comes to a place called Philippi. It's a Roman colony, just to give you a little background. It's, it was kind of fashioned like a little Italy. I mean, it was kind of a high-class place. It was a cool place to be. There were a lot of kind of retired Roman military and politicians. And they would go there, and they had amphitheater and all the, all the comforts as if you lived in Rome. I mean, all the colonnades and everything like that. And, all the, and, and so uh, there, just, there weren't a lot of Jews there. It was mostly just Roman citizens. In fact, when Paul goes down, we'll see he's going to go down for prayer. There's not even a synagogue there. And they go down to the river. He walks about, uh, it's about a mile, mile and a half, I read someplace. It, it was a little bit of a walk to get down to the river to pray on the Sabbath day. Well, let's, let's pick up the story here. He says, one day on our way to the place of prayer, a slave girl ran into us. She was a psychic and with her fortune-telling, made a lot of money for the people who owned her. She started following Paul around, calling everyone's attention to us by yelling out, These men are working for the Most High God. They're laying out the road of salvation for you. She did this for a number of days until Paul finally, fed up with her, turned and commanded the spirit that possessed her, Out! In the name of Jesus Christ, get out of her! And it was gone just like that. When our owners saw that their lucrative little business was suddenly bankrupt, they went after Paul and Silas, roughed them up and dragged them into the market square. Then the police arrested them and pulled them into a court with the accusation, these men are disturbing the peace, dangerous Jewish agitators subverting our Roman law and order. 
By the time the crowd had turned into, this time they had turned into a restless mob out for blood. The judges went along with the mob. Both Paul and Silas's clothes ripped off, ordered a public beating. And after beating them black and blue, they threw them into jail, telling the jailkeeper to put them under heavy guard so that there would be no chance of escape. And he did just that. He drew, threw them into maximum security cell in the jail and clamped leg irons on them. Now, along about midnight, Paul and Silas were at prayer, praying and singing. Let's just stop right there. Okay, so these guys, they disturb, you know, they go down to the river and people are listening to them. And there's, if you read earlier in the chapter, there's a lady by the name of Lydia who becomes a convert and and she's quite well to do, but, but that's not part of our story right now. This is about that slave girl. She could tell kind of fortunes, or at least people thought that she could. And she had a demonic spirit, a fortune-telling spirit. And so, Paul, it's interesting, Paul, out of the love and compassion of Jesus, no, he was just annoyed with her. She just kept harping, you know, just calling out every which way, every step that they took. And Paul was just fed up with her and just says, get out of her, stupid demon. And the demon leaves. And she can no longer tell fortunes with any effectiveness. And so the crowd gets mad. The business community is up in arms. The tourism association is going crazy. They're all just going nuts because their, their industry is gone. And so they beat Paul and Silas up, and then everybody, they end up getting pretty beat up after all of this. And then they are thrown into jail, but not just any old jail cell. They're thrown into kind of maximum security, solitary confinement, deep in the jail or the prison. They're thrown in, leg irons on them. There is absolutely no way these guys are going to escape from this primo Roman jail. Remember I said Philippi had every, all the best. Well, their jail was top-notch. So they have them all locked up. No way, no human way that they're going to escape. But watch their response. This is at midnight. And believe me, they didn't start worshiping and praising God. They didn't look at their Timex watches and go, bam, midnight. Time to start praising God. They were, they'd been praising God for hours. They'd been praising God since they got in there. And they were praising, they were at prayer and singing a robust hymn to God. The other prisoners couldn't believe their ears. Then without warning, a huge earthquake. The jailhouse tottered. Every door flew open and all the prisoners were loose. All the prisoners in the jail were loose, not just Paul and Silas. Startled from sleep, the jailer saw all the doors swinging loose on their hidden hinges, assuming that all the prisoners had escaped. Remember, it's pretty dark in here. He pulled out his sword and was about to do himself in, figuring he was as good as dead anyway, when Paul stopped him. Don't do this. We're all here. We're all still here. Nobody's run away. And the jailer got a torch and ran inside. Badly shaken, he collapsed in front of Paul and Silas. He led them out of the jail and asked, Sirs, what do I have to do to be saved, to really live? And they said, put your entire trust in the Master Jesus. Then you'll live as you were meant to live, and everyone in your house included. And they went on to spell out in detail the story of the Master. The entire family got in on this part. They never got to bed that night. The jailer made them feel right at home, dressed their wounds, and then he couldn't wait till morning. He was baptized, he and everyone in his family. There in his home, he had food set out for a festive meal. It was a night to remember. He and his entire family had put their trust in God. Everyone in the house was in on the celebration. And at daybreak, the court judges sent officers with the instructions, release these men. The jailer gave Paul the message because he took them back into the jail. And Paul says, no way. You can't just release us like that. And Paul, you can read the rest of the story. He puts up a stink because Paul was a Roman citizen. And you don't do that 
to Rome. You don't beat them up like that without a trial. And Paul does, he gets the magistrates to personally come down and say, we're sorry. <laughs> and they're released. But the point in, in all of this is to see what a crazy, crazy reaction that these two guys had. They're sitting in a jail cell. The rats are scurrying between their feet. They're in leg irons. They should have been miserable. But they had transformed thinking. Because jail cells can't hold God just as a cave or a grave cannot hold the Son of God. And the Son of God said, I came to set people free. I came to set the prisoners free. And that's not just about our hearts that are all closed up. It's not just a neat metaphor. It's about real life. He came to set prisoners free. And to set them free from a life of slavery and incarceration. And He does the same for us. And they were absolutely convinced of this. So they're praising God. They're thanking God ahead of time. Whether they're going to be released or not, no matter what happens, even if they die for the name of Jesus Christ, they're praising God because it's all win-win when you're a follower of Jesus. Just like General Abrams. We can attack the enemy from all directions. What an opportunity. <laughs> we're not surrounded. We have an opportunity and Paul and Silas had the opportunity to be able to say, thank you, God. We're here because of the Word of God, because of Jesus Christ. And we're fired up for Him. And we're going to praise Him and thank Him. And so I see three movements, you might say. Three things to remember. And just invitations to you. That when you're up against pressure in a prison cell and you're tempted to not be still and know about God when you're tempted to go all crazy and anxious. Three things to remember that Paul and Silas show us so well. Well, actually, to help you with this, you have your own visual aid. Pass one to a friend. To help you with that, just to remember, you can stick these in a book or on the dresser or wherever, to help you remember that when life gets tough, when the pressure cooker starts really steaming and whistling, three things that you can do, thanks to Paul and Silas. The first thing is when you experience pressure, go to prayer. The first movement is from pressure to prayer. And that's not just the pressure that you feel in your life, just like Paul and Silas did. When you feel financial or, or relationship pressures or future kinds of worries or past worries or whatever is bearing down on you, when you feel that pressure, you go to prayer. Because prayer reminds you, first and foremost, you're not going through this alone. You never go through anything alone. Ever. God is always with you. But the idea is, is we don't recognize that. We don't feel it. We're going, oh, woe is me. Where am I going? What's going on? And Jesus has said, go over here. Oh, I wish I had a friend, you know. And Jesus says, I'll be your friend. Oh, I wish somebody was here with me. Jesus says, I'm with you to the end of the age. Come on. <laughs> and we just don't get it because our thinking isn't transformed. We're not open to that, to that truth. So when you feel the pressure, but the other part of that pressure thing is that you don't extend pressure yourself. You say, well, I can fix this. I can fix this. I can do it. I've got the smarts. <laughs> and we try to fix it up and it's, it just falls apart. Or it's worse than when we began. Have you ever been there before? You know, try to fix something and it just, the tinker toys just don't quite stay together. What's going on? So God says, Listen to me. Watch and see. Just like he told the Israelites before the Red Sea. Egyptians behind them. Red Sea. We're going to drown. We'll either get stabbed in the back or drown. And God says, watch and see. Watch and see. And prayer brings us into that presence of God. That's the idea. And it's more about listening than it is about trying to exert Come on, God, you're with me. Come on, make it happen, you know. 
prayer is more about listening and watching. And you can pick this up, okay? I don't, you know, you're thinking, no, I'm not religious. I don't, I'm not really into the spiritual stuff. But you can pick it up. You can learn this stuff. You can see the direction of where God is going. What is Jesus up to you in this, this situation? And you remember to breathe, by the way. So from pressure, not only the pressure you experience, but don't you exert your own pressure. You go to prayer. You listen and you watch and you see. The second movement is from grumbling to gratitude. Okay, these guys could have been stupid Romans. <laughs> What's wrong with them, you know? Don't they realize legally they're doing this illegal stuff and, and they shouldn't have beat us up and, and stupid people. What's wrong with them? And grumbled the whole way. And, and then be mad at God too. I mean, really? Really? Do we have to do this? Really? And they go into gratitude that they're thankful to God. Part of their worship and praise is always, worship is always saying thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you. The Bible says be thankful in all things because it works the will of God perfectly in your life. Gratitude frees us up. It somehow takes the focus off of our little tiny small story. Oh, me, you know? I mean, pain is real, really. Uh, suffering is real, right? You know, but it's such a small part of the story because there's such a, a bigger picture there for us and only the Holy Spirit can open us up to that bigger picture and bring us, and only gratitude. Somehow there's something about saying thank you to God that just kind of switches the scene around. It switches everything, our feelings, our attitude. Even if we say it and it sounds so stupid, you know, thanks for all this suffering, you know, God. Got to hand it to you, you know, you really do a good job. Uh, you know, even if we, it begins to open us up to that bigger story, that place where God makes a space for us to be able to rest and breathe and be recollected in His power, to know that He is God. The third thing, the third movement, is from hostility to hospitality. And I borrow this phrase with all due reverence to uh, a priest by the name of Henry Nouwen, Maybe some of you have read some of his works. Catholic priest who wrote about this in a, in a book. And one of the movements here is from hostility to hospitality. And we see this not only with Paul and Silas. See, because the miracle, I mean, to me, I mean, one of the parts of the miracle is that all the gates and the doors and the chains and all this stuff, they all fell off from this earthquake. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And it's with all the prisoners. I mean, some of them were murderers, thieves, real scallywags, right? And it all falls off. But the, to me, the real miracle is that none of them escaped. They didn't take off. They're not like religious people and all this, you know? They didn't take, why didn't they take off? If you go earlier in the story, when Paul and Silas are praising God, there's a phrase in the story, and you can look it up in your own Bible. It wasn't as clear with Peterson, but it's there. There's a phrase that says they listened intently. Well, Paul and Silas were doing their thing, praising God. They listened. The Greek word means that in there, the New Testament. It means listening intently. Every one of those prisoners, they listened intently to what was going on. This strange, awesome Thing that these guys were doing. What kind of God would inspire that kind of trust, that kind of energy? They listened intently and that held them there. That was the magnet, the praise and the singing and just giving their lives and trusting God in that moment when they should have been grumbling and complaining. They listened intently and it held them in their places, every last one of them. And the guard would have been executed. If one of them had escaped, the guard would have been executed from this primo prison. And he was going to do it for them. And Paul says, wait, we're all here. Every last one of us. That's the miracle. 
And Paul exhibits a hospitality when he should have been mad. He should have said, eye for an eye. He said, should have said, vengeance on these stupid Roman uh, people. And, and let's get back. And let, we're all out of here. You know, you deserve to die. You know, you took us illegally. And probably half of these guys are here illegally. You deserve all this stuff. And he didn't do that. And he exhibited a hospitality. And what is hospitality? We get our word hospital from that. It's creating a space of healing for somebody. Creating a space of healing and rest for somebody. Jesus said we're supposed to do that with our enemies. Okay. <laughs> that's, for, that's what God does. And they, he created, they both created that space of healing for not only the prisoners, but for the guard too. And then what does the guard do? He risks his own life and he takes Paul and Silas and who knows what others, but we're told about Paul and Silas, bandages their wounds, gives them food, takes them into his own home and is convicted, convicted by a life, convicted by a way of thinking, convicted by a whole, a whole way of looking at reality that's so different from his but so full and so wholesome and so magnetic. And he goes, what do I have to do to get this? And Paul and Silas say, just trust our master, Jesus. And told them about how to do that. It's not rocket science. But it means admitting that you're thinking about life and living life from a whole different perspective. From hostility to hospitality. And the guard shows that to them. Because God shows that to us. No matter where you come from, no matter what kind of bad things you've been doing or bad attitudes you have or bad lifestyles or bad habits or whatever, no matter how much you beat yourself up with, guess what? God doesn't beat you up on that. He creates a space for you to rest and to heal. And He will wait for you. And you, when you finally realize that God's not the one who's going to beat you up, you look up and God's got His arms wide open. And He's ready to take you in when you're ready. When you're ready. So the final thing here is to remember to find those places that God provides for you. And they may be, it may be in the middle of the storm, but God will provide that space for you <sighs> to take a breath and know Him a little bit better. Whatever circumstance that you're in right now, whatever you're worrying about right now, whatever anxious moments you have right now, there is a space where you can be still and know that He is God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You so much for Your hospitality towards us. Even while we were hostile towards You, even in our hostility, You still give us that hospitality of Your Son. Those nail-scarred hands that reach out to us without reserve, without second thought, that we might take your hand and learn how to live life with a connection and a fellowship with you that we could never, ever make up ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for the gift. For the gift and the gifts that you place in our lives. Help us to have eyes to see, Lord. Help us to have the courage to submit all of our thinking, all of our ways of processing over into your hands. That you may remold us, remake us, reconfigure us, Lord, with some new vision. Help us to see the bigger story in all that we do. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.